Yes. Would you like to send a copy of that to somebody? Is it available? Um, the publication or the lecture? The lecture. I don't know. The lecture is about secrets. So. <laughs> Um, I, I will think about it. I will think about it. But I think um, it is intended to be about secrets. Carol, can you talk about the emphasis of your research and um, and this moment that we just kind of arrived here tonight? Sure. And Shorthanded. Um, so the publication that um, is, you know, in stacks, um, you're welcome to take one. It's the result of conversations with over 50 artists, activists, urban planners, whatever you want to call them, um, in seven different cities across the United States that are facing um, a housing crisis. And it is an attempt to start to articulate um, similar driving forces on a global scale, um, especially when you look at the presence of global capital and global companies, whether that's in the form of a multinational company like Facebook or a university that's attracting a lot of overseas capital and the role that it plays in driving local redevelopment and displacement. And it also looks at the role that culture plays in it, both as a complicit role um, when it comes to developers utilizing art to promote their real estate projects, but also as a role of resistance. Um, so we actually arrived at this moment for several reasons. Like I said, I think the lecture is about secrets because um, Ultimately, the content of this fellowship and research for me is not like materially encapsulated. Um, it's actually encapsulated in this understanding of temporality, of co-constructing public space, um, and honestly, of some like confidential information um, that I have had to keep. And I mean, I think that's like a reality of organizing, right? You just don't go out there and tell the world all your secrets um, and what you're going to do next. So how we got to this moment is that this performance performance is really a meditation on our understanding of culture, um, but also our understanding of space, how we co-create space, and our understanding of nothing. So I always, I think, yeah, because at the end of the exercise, you have nothing, right? And I think during the exercise, you're grappling with this like imagined body that never really comes in you know, into being or into fruition. And so for me, that is both, that is a metaphor, I think, for the resistance movement, for spatial capitalism, but also for the work that unfolded during the course. Yeah. Um, Carol, can you talk about the um, and then I just wonder how, over the course of the year, your understanding of um, capturing some of the energy of the enemy and maybe directing it against them has evolved. Like, if your idea of ways to do that has expanded or does it have to be Um, You know, I think it's still, like, it's for me in a vague state, right? I think that activists always talk about a both and. So it's either we got to seize the tools of the system and become the system, or we got to fight the system and destroy the system. Like, which is it, right? And so I met a lot of people who I think were working on the both and. They were working within the system, um, but they were also working to like fight the system at the same time. And so I think that, yeah, when we talk about redirecting energy, for me, that's systems work, right? And I think that's acknowledging the systems work that people do. Yes? There was a certain piece that talked about, and used the word evil, 
and uh, there were several instances uh, that began with what might be considered obvious, and then it's like evil is, evil is, and it went into uh, the daily grind, or persons you know, doing their jobs, so to speak. And I was reminded of Hannah Arendt and the banality of evil when she went to the trial of Gail Eichmann, who uh, made sure trains ran on time, and that was his plea, his defense. You know, that he didn't kill anybody, but he simply made sure the trains ran on time. And I wonder if there's some kind of banality of evil in, in, in what you said. I'm not suggesting. No, I, I think that there is a banality of the way in which these processes are reinforced. And I also want to, like, plainly state that I grapple with my own complicity all the time as an artist, um, as you know, someone with resources, like I don't really draw this line between good um, and evil so distinctly. And so I think that once again speaks to invisibility or being everywhere. And I think of these actions that we wouldn't really conceptualize as like evil per se, um, you know, of like letting papers get lost in bureaucracy. We don't conceptualize that as evil, but it's part of the systemic force that ultimately leads to disenfranchisement of vulnerable people. I guess like, this is something I've been up as a question, but it's kind of like connected. My working theory for a while has been that like sort of social practice or socially engaged art, like sort of, to me, which is like kind of like, has like the effect of taking like sort of parts of culture that sort of exist outside of the marketplace and pull them into like the marketplace art. And so like, in a way it's like the neo neo like you know, so this if, if it's like a neoliberal practice in itself to reappropriate a cultural practice like into an art context. I mean, I, yeah, may, maybe that's a thought. I mean, I actually think about that all the time. I wonder if I'm a social worker who just gets to be underpaid because they're an artist, you know? Um, yeah, and also, no, I think that's really valid, too. And so, I, like I said, I want to believe in the validity of the practice of the institution in which I'm embedded, but also of like something that I have devoted a considerable amount of time, thought, and energy to. But yeah, there's just something about the framing or the way that we can only understand social practices when it enters the art market that is a little bit suspect. I thought it was really interesting that you said that your performance was about secrets because it felt very resistant. It felt like you, in some ways, were resisting the audience, but you also, it could be argued, you made yourself into an object to be viewed and to, you know, perhaps, depending on who's watching, I think it's not an object. Um, and I'm thinking about this as a nation of some oh, yeah. as space, right? Um, so I'm wondering what was that risk for you, if you think of it that way, and also, was there anything that you felt scared about or was scary in terms of the project or this performance? Um, yeah, for sure. So, um, yeah, I'm very self conscious of being orientalized. Um, so, that is number one. Um, but I think that number two, for too long, um, I personally have maybe been presented with the option of either total erasure or total orientalization. And so this performance, um, while it might be totally different with a different audience um, in a different space, um, it was my attempt to think about how do we start to create a hybrid language um, but also understanding that like that hybrid language at times like is self-orientalizing, right? <laughs> um, you know, like sometimes <laughs> I, I put on a show too. <laughs> yeah. It, like, I 
the, the thing I, I was saying, so if you were saying that art can be suspicious in the way that it's like kind of incorporated into the whole neoliberal structure of things. Um, and then it's it's cool, I think, that we're all going to leave here and not have any like physical thing to hold on to other than this. But, yeah. but you know, like we're talking about nothingness. So are you asking us to evacuate everything out of art and start with nothingness and then like rebuild kind of from there? Or um, sort of avoid producing a residue and thinking of pieces that get kind of caught up in the stream of I think I'm asking for criticality around what we consider to be culture. So like nothing is kind of dual and it can also be intentional, right? Like when you look out at someone's like culture or neighborhood and see nothing, like that is like intentional erasure, right? And so I'm not like, I wouldn't be asking for erasure of that kind, I would be asking for like accountability around erasure and conversation around erasure. Um, as an artist coming from Dallas, can you talk about some of the similarities and differences you've observed between Dallas and Houston? Um, I'm Team Houston. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I want to say like if I were to talk very broadly, um, so the cities that I looked at were San Francisco, Oakland Bay Area, Los Angeles, Detroit, um, New York City, and Philadelphia. Um, I think that Dallas and Houston are unique. Um, in the disinvestment process. So what I mean by that is that like at some point all these other cities that I named had some type of social service that they decided to like pull out of the urban core, right? Or that they decided to disinvest. But what's unique about I think um, Dallas, Houston, and other Texas cities is that there has always been this attitude of libertarianism, which meant that like you weren't invested in in the first place, um, you know. And so I think that that produces a very different history and very different dynamic. Um, could you maybe say more about that? Um, sort of, uh, well, I'm also a dancer, um, a dancer, and in my community, um, you know, certain, certain things are seen as respectful, you know, uh, to sell the culture, to sell yourself, or in the sense of like, uh, there's certain things that you do, certain ways, certain things you do, you know, performance art. So, with that in mind, with that that question comes from um, about when you were in your research, your research. Um. Yeah. So I think that. I mean, I think where I have rested on this, like, does art gentrify? Question is that it really depends on who you consider artists um, and who you are considering, like what you consider to be art. And so oftentimes the art and culture of an existing community is devalued or posited as like not art, right? Um, and that's how you can have this kind of like empty backdrop um, for the real artists to come in. So yeah, for sure, I think there is devaluation. Um, and I know that recently, like there has also been a lot of appropriation as well. Um, yeah. 
So yeah, thank you for being here um, <laughs> and for your openness.